So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna get started on this here. So my name is Larry Woodman. I'm a, an engineer in the REL kernel group. I have been for about 18 years now. And if there's anything you don't like that I say, my boss is right there, so throw tomatoes at him and not me. <laughs> so so uh, this, this presentation is, I've, I've give, we've given this multiple times, and it's, I just wanna start by saying it's an overview. There's a lot of complexity in tuning, in tuning the kernel and in all the parameters associated with it. So this is by far an overview. It's not really in, an instructive way of tuning the kernel. It's, it, tells you how we do it. It gives you pointers to resources so that you can you know, in, get involved yourself as much as you want. So I'm gonna start by saying that uh, the performance of RHEL has evolved over the last, I've been here for 18 years. And, and I'm leaving off of probably the first half of that or something. So over the past close to 10 years, the performance has evolved uh, in, in both good and in complexity too. So, um, what, so what, how, how we're gonna go about this thing is to talk about um, uh, how the kernel is tuned, how, what, how, the, how RHEL 8, is, the performance is improved over RHEL 7 and how we improved it. And we'll get into, uh, the first section is just gonna be um, a bunch of a bunch of uh, graphs and so forth showing how much better RHEL 8 does than RHEL 7. And we won't even get back into the RHEL 6 time frame, but it's just a contrast of RHEL 8 versus RHEL 7. RHEL 7 was 3.10 based, and uh, we, I don't know how many people in here are, are Red Hatters and how are not, but Red Hat backports a bunch of upstream features into these kernels. So we come out with a major release every two or three years. And then um, over the life of the, the product itself, we backport and re do a small dot release every six to nine months. And in the course of doing so, we maintain the kernel's binary interface, the KABI. We make sure that any changes that we make don't change kernel data structures in such a way that if you have a module that you've tested, that um, you, you don't lose the testing for that. It's still compatible for the entire life of the, of the product itself. In the course of doing so, it's complicated because we sometimes have to omit fixes and so forth that we would like to get. So we just have to simply wait until the next major release if that happens. Um, we'll talk about uh, some disk I.O. database. Obviously database and I.O. performance is really big and it's a, the, one of the major focuses here. And then we're gonna talk about some of the changes that took place in RHEL 8 uh, in terms of hardware support and in terms of other features that we've taken in five-level page tables, NVDIM, some of the NUMA and uh, huge page support that we have in, in, the more, in, in RHEL 8 over RHEL 7. So this is some of the evolution that's happened, and you can see in RHEL 5, we, it, things were pretty static in RHEL 5. We had static huge pages, the CPU sets, and the tools that we used were pretty static. You literally, literally built the kernel with a lot of these things in it. And over the, as it evolved from six to seven to eight, everything came a lot more, became a lot more dynamic. We had good ways of adjusting parameters on the fly. We have much better ways of picking a, what we call a profile. So if you know you're gonna run on a database server or something, you can, out of the box, you can select what, what you want the system, how you want the system behave to behave, and it's fairly easy from that point to go forward and make small adjustments. Um, some of the parameters that I'm just going to talk about here, and, and by the way, there's a, there's a uh, um, utility or tuning technique we call TuneD, that we call TuneD, and TuneD is a, a basically it applies a bunch of tuning parameters at boot time, and some of them can be adjusted after boot time too. And if you look in these TuneD profiles, you see a bunch of kernel tuning parameters, and that's sort of what I'm going to talk about here. These are uh, um, the scheduling parameters that control how long a quantum is. Obviously, if the quantum is longer, you trade off throughput versus performance. I'm not saying you trade off throughput versus latency. So um, the same thing is true with a lot of the other parameters. If you, uh, um, if you want a system that's very responsive versus does a huge amount of work in a shorter amount of time, then you tune it for latency. If you want the opposite, then you tune it for throughput. 
Um, we'll talk about P states and the CPU states and all that. There's, there's parameters that control the write back, that control the read ahead and all this other stuff, and we'll sort of get into some of these as we go. So TuneD, the, the TuneD tool, we have multiple TuneD profiles that are sort of set up to, uh, or pre-selected, so that you can say this, is, this system is going to be I, I, well, I'll just come up with some examples. A laptop is, or a workstation is obviously balanced between throughput and latency. There's specific profiles for guests and hosts and um, high performance uh, uh, throughput for um, database servers and for low latency, uh, low latency for like uh, stock trading applications and so forth. So the way that uh, TuneD works is it's hierarchical. If you, you basically select, you can basically select a, a, prof, a profile, the latency performance profile here is going to be low latency, so it's going to be, it's going to set parameters so that you, uh, so that it, it'll maybe compromise some of the throughput so that you get very fast response times. And then on that, you can basically come up with a profile. You can include, like, like in the, this example here, I included the, the, um, the, in, in a network low latency profile, uh, TuneD profile, we included the latency profile and then overwrote, you can either, in addition to some of the tuning parameters, you can set or you can override ones that are in, uh, in, the, uh, the, in what you've included. So, and it's hierarchical, like I said, you can, you can say I want a, uh, a network, a low latency network profile and you start with the low latency profile then you add the network tuning parameters in, and you can keep going in more and more of a hierarchy, and that's how you develop your TuneD profiles, is you keep adding more layers to this, uh, to this profile. So um, the next little section I want to talk about here is out, sort of out-of-the-box uh, testing. So what we did, or the, I didn't do it, one of the, the performance czar, I helped him do this, kind of went through and determined how RHEL 8 behaves out of the box and how, uh, if you apply these TuneD profiles to, to the kernel, how it runs and, and so forth. And we get a bunch of graphs to sort of show how much better RHEL 8 is or how, how well we, we have evolved over RHEL 7 and previous versions. And to do that, we're going to talk about CPUs, memory. We support a lot of memory now. We support up to 48 terabytes, actually even larger systems we're testing right now. And we'll get into the need of expanding even beyond the four-level page tables. Various networks, disk I.O. And, and security, we have a bunch of... Uh, data here on the CVEs that have been exposed over the last couple of years. The, they have uh, solved the, the, um, the security violations, but in the course of doing so, there's frequently performance consequences to doing that. So um, what this here is, is it shows, uh, let me just, it shows um, the, the typical gains that we get, that we've gotten in RHEL 8 over RHEL 7. So you can see for CPU stuff, streams, Linpack, between, we get on the order of 5% gains just out of the box and with the, with the profiles that we have in place. For Java, for spec JBB, for JavaScript and all that, for AIM and so forth, we're talking about a 20% gain in a lot of these benchmarks. So it's substantial. Uh, Disk I.O., databases, OLTP and all that, we're between 15 and, once again, between 15 and 20 cent is a percent is a big Gain. And there's a lot of work that's been done in the networking, network loads, and especially in smaller packets, and we'll get into some of that, but TCP, UDP, small packets, we get, you know, it's not unusual to get 25 or 30 percent gain in some of these. And then finally, the network bypass code, um, DPDK and so forth, RDMA, it's better, but because it bypasses the kernel, the kernel really isn't necessarily in the way anyway, so we're, this, a lot of this might be due to hardware that we support in RHEL 8 that we didn't support in RHEL 7, but not all of it. Um, let's see what I want to say here. So uh, the uh, performance star likes these, pull, almost looks like a polar coordinate graph of how we've, how when RHEL 7 was, uh, I'm sorry, when RHEL 8 was evolving and we were pulling pieces in and backporting it, you can see that the, the blue was early versions of RHEL 8, and as it's evolved and we've backported more and more of these features into RHEL 8, you can see that the performance has expanded out even more. And uh, 
this is for, you know, uh, uh, so basically from this point on, we'll go forward and talk about some of these benchmarks and, and what we've done and how we've achieved really good results. So this here is AIM-7 uh, running on XFS multi-user, and as you can see, the difference between RHEL 7 and 8 is we get a, a really big boost on, uh, as we get a larger number of users um, for shared throughput. As far as database is concerned, it's better. It's not as substantial or as much, it's not as dramatic as the shared throughput or the file server stuff. The file server stuff is also much more extreme for a variety of different reasons. Some of the stuff was tested with uh, um, uh, NVDIM that we didn't support in, in RHEL 7, and so it's a combination of algorithmic changes in the kernel, tuning, and hardware that we now support in RHEL 8 over versus, versus RHEL 7. Um, this is, uh, this is um, the exact details of why, like AIM, runs so much better. This is the, like the output of the, the profiler, and you can see that the, in this particular case, a lot of the, the, the algorithms have changed and the hardware has changed and so forth so that, that we support, so that the spin locking and so forth is out of the way. There's a lot more lockless code in RHEL 8 than there was in RHEL 7, and because of that, we don't, you don't spend as much time spinning on locks and so forth. There's a lot more parallelism that takes place in the, in the kernel and in user mode as well, just because you're not waiting on spin locks and so forth, or spinning on locks. And you can see the results are, you know, a, I don't know, a 10% gain or something like that of RHEL 7, uh, of RHEL 8 over RHEL 7. Um, this is uh, the Intel, um, what the, this is the advanced vector instructions, the AVX instructions. I don't know if anybody's familiar with these, but um, the CPUs that we support include these advanced vector instructions. And you can get really big boosts, uh, really big boosts being, um, in terms of actual numbers, I don't know, but the instructions themselves in these CPUs allow um, vector processing, and uh, so they start to rival some of the FPGA times that we get in, um, with, these, with the CPUs that use these vector instructions. And this is just supporting this type of a CPU in RHEL 8 over RHEL 7 and using it in various libraries and uh, the compiler that we, that we use actually generates these instructions in RHEL 8 where it didn't in RHEL 7. Um, this is, uh, uh, once again, this is like an out-of-the-box picture of what we do for streams, uh, t for network loads, for small, um, let's see, yeah, for 64-byte packets, you can see we get a you know, a big boost, you know, 20, 30%. And as the packet size gets bigger, it flattens out because the, the, the optimizations were made in, in the kernel for smaller packet sizes. So um, it, the performance of smaller packet sizes in RHEL 8 over RHEL 7 is very good. Um, let's see, XDP for performance, this shows uh, the, um, basically getting the kernel out of the way with uh, DPDK and so forth. You can see you get really big gains here um, over, um, over RHEL, of RHEL 8 over RHEL 7 because we didn't support a lot of this stuff in RHEL 7 and it's not even possible. So. All right, so this is uh, another one of these sort of polar coordinate things that he, the performance SAR likes to put together, and it just shows that the, as we evolved RHEL 8 over time, that these, um, some of these other benchmarks gained a lot of performance over, over time. Um, okay, so for, now I'm going to talk a little bit about, those were, those were benchmarks, and I want to talk about database tuning tips, which are really uh, real-world applications. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, both MariaDB and PostgresDB, or I should back up and say that all databases have a fairly common uh, set of tuning parameters that we do. So if you look in their TuneD profiles, there'll be a database TuneD profile, and then there'll be um, uh, one that includes the database TuneD profile that is unique to the database you're actually running yourself, so running on. So like for MariaDB, the, they're all, in all databases, you almost always want to use huge pages. Huge pages 
I'll talk about this in detail a little bit later, but when you use huge pages, they're actually removed from the page list, so the system can't reclaim them. It's, they're just, it's like you booted the system without that memory and set it aside for the database to use. And when you do something like that, you just basically tell the kernel, get out of the way, and, and that's, that's what it's doing. So it reduces TLB misses, it wires down the pages, um, it prevents any kind of swapping that could take place. The worst thing you could do in a database is swap and sit there and reclaim memory. So it, it totally eliminates that. And then, there's, then we do what we, we call dirty uh, background writing. And then what, what dirty background writing is, is if, if you have a page, you, we cache the contents of files in something we call the page cache. And it's a write back cache. So there are tuning parameters that allow you to determine how early or how late the system starts flicking pages back to disk. And then if you exceed the capacity of the, of a, the system to, quote, flick pages back to disk, you can actually tell, tune the system so that the process that's actually writing is forced to block and write those pages back to disk. And um, lowering, or making the system write back pages earlier produces a lower latency result but generally with a, lower, with a lower throughput as well, because if you, if you did absolutely nothing because you, didn't, because you were never going to need to write anything back to disk, the last thing you'd want to do is write anything to disk, so you would increase the, the tuning parameters, the tune profiles would increase these tuning parameters to a higher value, and that's what the throughput profiles do. The latency profiles do just the opposite. They lower this value so that when it goes to write pages back to disk, a lot more of the page cache is clean and has a lot less work to do on every iteration. But because it's doing more work overall, it has a lower throughput. So, and then the size of sizing the pools and, and um, sizing the, 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 each one of these database databases has their own user level tuning that takes place as well. And they control stuff like how big chunks of virtual memory are allocated to the thing, how big the, their equivalent of the page cache is, and what the it, Oracle calls the SGA. And uh, so just from, just by, uh, just you can see just the out of the box performance. I, this, I just wanted to say, the actual data results you'd have in terms of performance, you'd have to look at this polar graph, so to speak. But you can see that the, um, that the uh, MariaDB um, performance of RHEL 8 over RHEL 7 is substantial. It's, it's double-digit percentages. The same thing is true for Postgres. Um, Postgres isn't as, isn't as extreme because of its Postgres is a multi-threaded versus a multi-processed uh, database and multi-threading, even in RHEL 7, took advantage of a lot of the lack of scheduling and so forth that takes place. You don't need to schedule and, and context switch as much, so to speak, in a multi-threaded process because the address space is resonant on all the CPUs versus MariaDB. It's, it's a process-based database, so um, it, it's going to... It's, it, con it may context switch just as much, but when it context switches, it doesn't need to change the, the address space. Okay, as far as Oracle is concerned, uh, um, the, once again, this is going through the TuneD profiles for Oracle. Um, once again, you implement, you make sure you use huge pages so that you reduce TLB misses, you wire the page cache, it's the Oracle page cache of the SG in memory, you prevent swapping at all. Um, in the case of Oracle, we do a couple of things that we don't do in other databases. We turn off what we call autonuma. The autonuma code in the kernel trolls around and determines if it should migrate pages from one NUMA node to the next so that you get local memory accesses versus remote memory accesses. In the case of Oracle, the, generally speaking, it's configured such that it's larger than any, of the, any single NUMA node. And if it's larger than any single NUMA node, you're not going to be able to do anything in terms of, of moving stuff around anyways. It's going to be just going to spend all of its, not all of its time, but it's going to spend system time, valuable system time, moving pages around only to have to move them around again once the, once the 
database engine itself starts making other remote memory accesses. So with Oracle, you're going to see the Tundi profiles will shut off AutoNuma. It'll also turn off what we call transparent huge pages. Transparent huge pages is a mechanism in which we use the large, this is all Intel based. I'm not, I'll, we can talk about other architectures after, but this what I'm talking about right here is all Intel based. So Intel supports 4K, 2 meg, and 1 gig page sizes. Um, if by default, uh, the anonymous memory that is allocated to a process, if it can, will use 2 meg pages. Uh, the, that, that's a positive thing in that you touch a 2 meg page once and it instantiates the entire 2 megabytes of memory. The downside is it, is, is it does say it instantiates the 2 megabytes of memory, so it's going to consume more memory. And when the system runs out of memory, it's going to have to start cruising through these huge pages, breaking them into small pages. So there's a background daemon that runs, and that background daemon introduces latency. So in order to get the database to perform to its maximum, we, we shut off uh, um, transparent huge pages. In terms of, uh, um, the, we, I talked about this before, these dirty ratios. Since Oracle uses the page cache, you can actually, a, a database can either be designed to use the, the operating system kernel's page cache or avoid using it. In the case of Oracle, it uses it. So um, in order to lower the latency, we lower the background, uh, the background ratio, which determines when the system starts flicking out pages, but we increase the dirty ratio. So that, that's, the, that's the threshold at which it stops the process and starts making it contribute to the write backs as well. So opening that window provides a higher, higher performance for Oracle. Um, NUMA pinning, uh, this, this is the whole section that I'm going to talk about, about NUMA and pinning and on all this, that the, the, probably the single most area that you can, you can gain performance in any of these systems is in NUMA pinning, is in making sure that you don't do remote memory accesses, and I'll talk about that in more detail in just a couple of minutes here. And then this SGA, once again, this is the, this is basically the page cache of Oracle. So you, you have to make sure that the system's parameters are in unison with the, the, uh, oh, the, the system's tuning parameters are in unison with the database tuning parameters. If you don't, if you don't do that, if you don't make sure that they're, that they're together, they're going to fight with each other. The database uh, cache, but the, the SGA is a system global area is what it stands for. It's the page cache of the database. It's, and if it is larger than the, than the operating system's page cache, it's going to overcommit the, the memory and the system is going to swap. So it needs to be adjusted based on the NUMA characteristics of the system and based on the amount of RAM that the system has. Um, so his, uh, this is RHEL 8 versus RHEL 7, um, Oracle, Oracle 12. This is just a, I, I just grabbed one of the, the slides that sort of illustrated this. And as you can see, most of the time we do better in RHEL 8 than we do in RHEL 7, but there are sets of users in which we ran some workload, and then with 40 and 80 users, there was actually a slight decrease of RHEL 7 over RHEL 8, and that had to do with just algorithmic changes in the kernel. So if you run into something like this, this is, this, if you ran into something like this, this would tell you this, the system is ripe for additional tuning. It would say you, you should take that tune D profile and start messing around and, and figuring out what you could do to, if, you, if you're in this 40 and 80 user load and you want to improve the performance, the, this, is, this tells you that it's, it's sort of ripe for learning. And uh, I'm sorry, ripe for tuning. And there's, I'm going to show you there's some um, uh, pointers, hyperlinks to papers that tell you exactly what to focus in on, on, on this when you're, when you're doing this. And the next thing I want to talk about is the um, Microsoft SQL Server we, in RHEL 8. So we support it in RHEL 7, but in RHEL 8, there's a whole bunch of changes algorithmically in the kernel that we made that are, were Red Hat made and which also backported from upstream to optimize the, the performance of, of that. So 
The Microsoft, that, that's a completely different beast. The way that they, uh, Microsoft port back, port, are ported the SQL server onto Linux is, is it's got a whole layer of software in there that emulates, rather than changing the, the source code so that it layered on top of a Unix system, it was designed to run on a Windows system. And then rather than redesigning the database, they came up with a layer of code that translates from Windows and the Windows environment to the uh, to the uh, um, Linux environment, and we spent quite a bit of time with them. I worked with them, and other people at the in the group work with Microsoft in terms of optimizing this. They there is no equivalent of like System Five shared memory in in Windows and some of these other features that Linux um, supports, and that in are the ones that give us the optimal performance. So um, so. In the case of uh, Microsoft SQL Server, you can see this is, once again, you have to go back to the, that little polar coordinate graph to show how uh, um, exactly what these numbers are. But in all cases, we've measured um, the performance of the SQL Server running on RHEL 8 is better than RHEL 7. And then, uh, let's see what else. Uh, this is just a sort of a performance summary. We talk about micro benchmarks, databases, Java, SAP. So this, uh, the deeper in the, the, this presentation, um, I'm sort of skipping through some slides so I can make progress here in a one hour time frame. But there's more information on here, in here on how to tune Java systems, SAP, SAS, all of these. And there are, in addition, there are hyperlinks in here that point you to papers on what to look for and how to, how to go about this. So that was the first section, just base, basically talking about um, uh, out-of-the-box performance and performance improvements using the Tune D profiles that we talked about earlier for a variety of different benchmarks and real-world applications. The next section I want to talk about here is NUMA. Like I said before, NUMA systems, uh, this is probably the single biggest area for performance gain you can get. And, any tuning endeavor. So systems are now, they're all like this. Even your laptops are made up, are, are NUMA systems. They're NUMA building blocks, or what we call nodes. Each node has several cores. It has shared cache. It has a bunch of RAM. And it has some sort of links that connect to, to interconnect the nodes and to connect to the outside world for DMA devices and so forth. And how well we do in terms of placement of processes in the memory that the process is using is the single largest factor in determining how well the system is going to perform. So um, this, is, this is what they look, this is what a NUMA you know, look, system looks like. And like I said, even laptops now, now they have NUMA systems and chips. So inside the chip, even though you might say, oh, this only has one CPU in it, a lot of these CPUs are, are NUMA systems internally. They have multiple memory controllers and everything in them. So there is a um, command NUMA CTL, and you, there's several different options you can pass to it. And I have hyperlinks in here to tell you how to, win, how to use it and how to interpret it. But if you would do a NUMA CTL minus minus hardware on some system, I just grab this thing and it says it's a four node system. Each node has uh, 64 gigs of memory. It's a small system. It just, I forget what it was, 256 gigs or something. It was a and, and it tells how much memory is on the system, how much memory is free. It tells you which CPUs that each one of these nodes um, includes. And it also tells this little table down at the distance, down at the bottom, we call the slit table, the system location, and I forgot what it stands for. But anyways, it tells you the relative memory, bandwidth, and latency performance associated with that. Uh, um, with, with, the, with the system. So in this particular case, uh, if you, it, what, what's always necessary is to, is to minimize the memory um, latency time by making sure that you're, that you're executing on the same node that the memory is allocated on. Um, another tool to, that is more graphic is called LS Topo. It shows you the same amount of information, but it's graphical. Um, 
There's, so this NUMA CTL command allows you to see the system, but it also allows you to do pinning. It allows you to say, I want, I want a program to run on this node, I want the memory to be allocated on this node, and I want it, the CPUs that it executes to be running on hopefully the same node, but you can actually do the opposite and move, you can actually force the system to run this, for the execution to run on one node, the memory to be allocated on another node, and if you did that, you're gonna get higher latencies and lower throughput by doing that. So this is just, uh, once again, there's a hyperlink later on in this that, that, that tells you how to use it and how to evaluate the output of it and so forth. Um, this is just an example of, uh, um, we t I talked earlier about disabling new, what we call NUMA balancing. The kernel has internal algorithms to, to monitor and see where a program is running and where the memory is, is, is allocated. And if you, by default, if you allocate a program, if you run a program and you uh, that program allocates a bunch of memory, and for some reason it's not allocate. It, it, for some reason it ends up doing remote memory accesses. The kernel will over time monitor this and start to migrate the memory and or the threads so that they're running on the same CPU. And this is an example of that. So this this at the, at the top you can see that these guests were just scattered all over the place, and then over time. What happens is over time you can see that the, this particular process migrated so that it's, all its memory was on the same node, so that all the memory references are now local versus remote, and you'll get a optimal, system, optimal performance of the application by doing this. Once again, we have, there are hyperlinks in here to tell you exactly what to do and how to, how to monitor and manage this stuff. So as far as inside the kernel is concerned, I just want to talk a little bit about how this is implemented in the kernel and why it's tunable, why it's necessary to tune it. So this is what basically memory looks like in, uh, on a system. The uh, node zero always contains a couple other what we call zones. Nodes contain zones of memory, and node zero always contains two, node, two zones that the other ones don't. And these are the first 16 megabytes and first four gigabytes of of memory for, for DMA purposes. Um, these are called the DMA zone and the DMA32 zone. But other than that, every, so the first four gigs of memory on the system always go to node zero, and then all the other memory is uh, scattered all, all around all the NUMA nodes, but this is always a given, so. And then um, inside of the, so the kernel itself maintains a paging thread we call k swap d in case there is one k swap d per numa node so in these so it's it's almost like a little network of computers inside your system in which the k you can so that what this means by the way is that um, you can allocate you can have a program running on node on a given node that uses all the memory and actually can be reclaiming memory and swapping while the other ones are completely uh, have an abundance of memory. So, and this is a fairly normal thing to see. And there are, if, if, you, um, if you incorrectly uh, pin the, the process to a given node and allocate the memory from another node, then you'll see this, this case swap that will run and it'll be, migrating pages around and all that so forth. So I just wanted to, th this is important to understand this when looking at how to pr analyze the system. So there is, th this is why I want to talk about some of the, uh, the tuning parameters that you'll see in these tuned D profiles. There's a, def there's a section of them that are sort of dependent on, on NUMA. And these are what we call swappiness, determines how aggressively the system reclaims anonymous memory. Min free k bytes is how much free memory the thing, the node has. And uh, um, zone reclaim mode is a, I'll talk about that in a minute, is a, is a really big switch to determine if you, when the system runs out of memory, if you want to reclaim locally or you want to, um, it, when the system runs out of memory, if you want to reclaim just the memory on that node or you want to allocate memory 
through the other nodes. And this is a, this is a trade off of throughput versus latency. If you have a, an application that's going to run for a long period of time, it's probably desirable to make sure that, that you all the memory, even though it's more expensive to start it up, that, you, that all the memory on for that process is on the same node, node, even if it means reclaiming memory on that node, versus, local, versus allocating it remotely. This, the, you said five minutes. Huh? This goes to, to 55, right? 12, 155? OK. OK for Q&A. Just looking for time here. Um, so this, like I said, this, this, this is a big one here, this zone reclaim mode. I just said before, if, if you set, if by default uh, it's set to zero on a lot of systems, and what, what this means is if you exhaust the memory on the node that you're on, rather than forcing KSwapD to reclaim, it'll just simply step onto another node and allocate the memory there, and then it'll let the NUMA balancing code in the kernel deal with it. It'll move stuff around, causing high, higher latencies. And uh, if you set this to one, what this says is it says if we run out of memory on a given NUMA node, force that node to start memory reclamation, which can require page cache reclaiming and swapping and all this stuff as, as, it, as it goes. Um, like I said, the the default is set to zero. It was set to one, but up in the upstream kernel, uh, the maintainers started to realize that, that the majority of the time, you want the thing to allocate, you want the thing to spill over onto another node and allocate and let the NUMA um, balancing code deal with it. Since we shut off the NUMA balancing code in a lot of these uh, Tune D profiles, we have to be very careful that we don't that we don't end up causing the system to be in a state that it does a lot of remote memory accessing. Okay, so that was a sort of a talk about NUMA and the, the, what you can do for NUMA to make the system allocate and uh, perform better. The next thing I want to talk about is huge pages. This is a, probably the second biggest area that you can make a, a performance difference. The, like I said, the Intel architecture supports three page sizes, 4K, 2 meg, and 1 gig. Each TLB, each TLB entry um, is, as, is associated with a page size. So if you have um, four, so if you, I'll just make something up here. If you had 512 entries um, in this, in the, each entry uh, mon, maintained 4K, 4K times 512 is what? Two megabytes. The, the, that would limit the size of the TLB to, to two megabytes before it started doing TLB reclaiming, and it's all transparent, but it slows the system down. Um, if, you, if, the, uh, um, if you use two meg pages, then it's going to be, give you five twelves times as much memory. So it's going to be half a, what, half a gigabyte instead of uh, um, two megabytes. And if you use one gig pages, if you force the system to use one gig pages, it'll, the TLB will man, manage and maintain 512 gigs. All, all very positive things. The downside of doing this, though, is, like I said, if you touch one byte in a page, it'll instantiate either two megs or one gig, and the system will potentially run out of memory faster and will um, uh, end up with more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, you'll end up, uh, um, It'll, it'll basically force the system to start reclaiming and, and trolling through memory in order to break it down into smaller pages. If you allocate to two meg page, the system runs out. It has to break it into smaller pages, the 4K page size, in order to do that. And this introduces a lot of latency. And this is why some of these profiles, especially database tuning profiles, disable transparent huge pages. So this is just a picture of the, of the different memory sizes, and this is how they're used in the database, uh, in database tuning. They use this, the, you'll see a lot of this tuning, use the uh, Proxys VM and our huge pages. It'll, that, what that does is it removes a bunch of memory from the normal paging list and sticks it on a look aside list that only the database or the application that I'll, that requested that can use. In the course of doing so, it prevents the system from reclaiming any of this. So doing this has a, a really positive side effect in that 
it's impossible to page a swap any of this memory. It also has a really big negative side effect, and it's like pulling memory out of the box. So if you, if you, if you have an, this is where it's important to make sure the system tuning matches the database tuning. If you tell the database, um, if you tune the database to use, I'll just make something up, a gigabyte of, of memory for um, the, the database disk block cache, and you tell the system to use two, two gigabytes, you're not, you're gonna re, it's like removing a gigabyte of memory from the system. Gigabytes are small in today's world, so I should have used terabytes, I guess. But, but anyways, it's the same, it's the same thing. This is, so this is a description of how, how to use two meg huge pages and one gig huge pages. In, RHEL, in earlier versions, early RHEL 7, we backported some features. To, to eliminate this, but you had to you had to allocate the one gig pages at boot time, and they were never reclaimed back in. In rel eight, and in the later versions, the later dot releases of rel seven, um, the system can dynamically uh, expand and contract the one gig pages, which is a big positive, which is a big plus because you don't have to reboot the system. You used to have to reboot the system if you wanted this memory back, and that's a pretty big problem in terms of. So this is just pictures on how to do this. You can see when you, you, when you allocate the memory and when it gets used, what it looks like. This is the proc, the, uh, proc mem info, the proc file system shows you where memory is. And a lot of these uh, um, hyperlinks that you're going to see in here tell you, uh, refer to this stuff. So. Um, transparent huge pages. Uh, the, the previous one, by the way, this, these huge pages are only used by Huge steel BFS, which which means it's a file system. It's it's a meta file system and system five shared memory, which databases all use for their disk block cache, is layered on top of huge steel BFS. So the only way to use these standard huge pages is through the huge through huge steel BFS and the, uh, the um, system five shared memory. By default, transparent huge pages are anonymous memory. So your stacks, your heaps, and all that stuff. If you do an MMAP anonymous or an SBreak or a malloc, and it's two gigabytes, I'm sorry, two megabytes or greater, it'll use huge pages for that. Once again, you get all the benefits of huge pages and all the negative sides of huge pages. So you have to make sure that if you're really concerned about latency, you want to shut this stuff off so you don't have demons and threads running in the background coalescing pages and all this. That introduces a lot of latency. It introduces performance, as you can see, um, by using, by shutting off huge, deal, by shutting off transparent huge pages. I wrote this stupid little program that allocated a bunch of memory and danced around in memory. And you can see it took 12 seconds to run the thing when I, when I didn't use uh, um, Transparent huge pages, but when I did use transparent huge pages, the time went from 12 seconds to seven seconds. Really big, really big performance boost. But what that did is it, is it um, uh, introduced a lot of latency. So if, you, if, you, if you're running a, a latency sensitive application, like a data, I'm sorry, a stock trading application, which is really important, you want to sell your Whatever stock, I won't even say what company, but if you want to sell your stock and, and you really are concerned that the, that the, the stuff happens in, in, in a, a given amount of time without high latency spikes, you typically shut this stuff off. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to go another five minutes on this. Unless somebody has questions, I'm just going to sort of continue blasting through this because some of the stuff is important if you're reading the... Uh, the um, just the papers that we have on, on tuning systems. So um, this, is just, this is just something we put in here for, this is only for, di for benchmarking. Um, when the system, after a while, the system, you boot the system, after a while it, uh, you do run different programs and it pulls, it consumes all the memory. Most of the memory gets consumed in the page cache. It's easily reclaimable, but it, consumes, it gets consumed in the page cache, which is caching disk block data. It also gets consumed in another cache called the slab cache, which is ba basically operating system and file system metadata. It's the kernel data structures, and it's the, it's the data structures associated with not the file system data, but the, the, uh, the management of data on disk. There are, you can, rather than rebooting your system to get this back, if you root, 
you can go in there and echo into Proxys VM drop caches. You can echo a tri state. They're bits. If you echo a one in there, it dumps the page cache, all the page cache memory, which is going to be a substantial performance hit if you were if, if you cared about the contents of that. But if you're trying to run benchmarks rather than rebooting the system all the time, you can just dump the page all the page cache memory out. The same thing is true with the slab cache. You you don't want to do this unless you're running benchmarks. But in order to expedite the tuning process, and in order to you know, you're messing with the tuning parameters and you want to say, how did this work? Rather than rebooting the system, you just echo this into, prox into drop caches and boom, the page cache and the slab cache go away on you. All the memory gets freed. Um, this, the, as far as how stuff works, when you do a read, read or write operations, we have a data structure or a set of data structures in the kernel called the page cache. It's a write back cache. So what that means is when you write to it, it just copies in there and says, okay, I'm done. And then there are background threads that flush the contents of this page cache to disk on demand. And there are also read, there are, and you, you can tune this. You can tune how aggressively the system writes these modified pages back to disk and you can tune the thresholds. Um, the ones that I wanted to talk about here are the background and dirty background ratios. So the, basically the, the page cache has three levels to it, so to speak. When, when there is almost none of it's dirty, when almost none of the page cache is dirty, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't write the pages back to disk or anything. But when you exceed this background dirty ratio, which is a tunable parameter, it's 10% by default, every time you go to write a page and it uh, crosses that threshold, it does a thread wake up of the the flush daemon that flushes pages out. And when that flush daemon runs, it flicks pages out and uh, it, in an attempt to keep the, the dirty page list down here. If you overwhelm it by writing several programs all writing at the same time, you can overwhelm it and come up to this background, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, to this dirty ratio. Once you hit the dirty ratio, every time you write, go to write a modified, every time you mo go to modify a page and exceed that threshold, it makes your page, it makes your process become a flesh demon. So it stops you and boom, you're obviously introducing a lot of latency to, this, to the thing. So this is where the tuning of this is so, is so critical, especially in and around databases and file, uh, file system benchmarks. Um, memory tuning, there's a, there's a parameter that you'll see in all of the TuneD profiles called swappiness. What swappiness does is it determines how aggressively the system reclaims anonymous memory versus page cache, file system page cache memory. It's, it's not a percentage or anything. I don't know why we put percent. It's an integer between zero and 100. It's set to 60 by default. And basically what happens is when the system, when K swap D runs, because the free list gets down low, it uses the swappiness to determine how whether it should go after page cache pages or anonymous pages. If it's a, obviously, if you are running something that's highly uh, file system sensitive, then you want to lower this to, uh, to force the system to reclaim file, clean page cache pages instead of, uh, uh, of anonymous memory pages. Anonymous memory pages always need to be written to swap space. So there's a real big negative aspect of doing that. So this, this is just, a, I, this, this is referenced by one of, the, uh, one of the white papers we have that's in, later on in this presentation. And this is just a picture of, of what the VMstat output looks like, VMstat's a tool that tells you where the memory is on the system and how, uh, how much time it is spent, how much time is spent in user mode, system mode, idle, and so forth. It shows you the difference between uh, fiber channel storage and SSD storage. SSD storage obviously being a lot faster. So you can see over there the use, with fiber channel storage, the same process or the same benchmark um, has you, the user time is you know f between 25 and 50 percent. This it's obviously there's always some system time and uh, um, the 
if you're waiting for disk I.O., you're going to have idle time. But since the SSDs do almost no waiting for I.O. at all, you can see the user time goes way up. So this is an example of quote tuning that involves substituting SSDs for rotating media. Um, this is just an overview of these, uh, the tuning that, we ta that I talked about here. Um, uh, this, I, I, I think this is the same thing I said before. These are the, these are the most common tuning parameters you're going to see in these Tune D profiles. They're the ones our white papers describe the most. We pick the, basically the biggest, uh, the, the, the parameters that have the biggest result, and, and these are the ones that you're going to see in there. Um, these are the white papers in the, in the um, if you go to the, uh, the presentation itself, these are hyperlinks to give you all of our tuning guides and um, blogs. And, uh, you know, we have tons of, of write-ups and descriptions and um, documentation of how, of how all this stuff works. And then, basically, I think we're pretty close. This goes to 55, 1350. Okay. So I guess, that, I guess I ran out of time. This was the, the last thing I was going to show here that I don't have time for is things we introduced in RHEL 8. The uh, five-level page table support allowed you to in increase both the virtual memory size and the physical memory size. This is necessary because of what we call persistent memory, or NVDIMM support. NVDIMMs are much larger than RAM by a fact, by an order of magnitude or even more. What this means is we're going to run out of virtual and physical address space. So in order to be able to deal with these much larger chunks of memory coming up in the very near future, we need five-level page table support. Um, so I just, this is just a picture of what it looks like, what the, what the uh, page tables actually look like. Talk about persistent memory. Persistent memory can either be used as storage or RAM. And uh, I don't think I have time to go through this. These guys are giving me the evil eye. Is there any questions? If not, I'll, I'll be outside if somebody wants to chat about this stuff. I can definitely give you pointers to everything that I talked about in much more detail. There isn't enough time in a one-hour presentation to do anything other than skim this stuff. And there's a lot of reading left up to the, to the whoever wants it, who's interested in that. <laughs>